Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm very uh, happy to host you. We, we are very happy to host you in this, uh, in this session, um, a session which should be a, a battle, a food storytelling battle, but a gentle battle, of course. Um, words of introduction. Um, social innovation movement uh, have uh, concentrated a lot on uh, food issues in, in cities, a lot of food initiatives that you all know now on growing food, on transforming food, on <clears throat> and um, maybe in a certain way some critical voice could say um, this does not uh, produce a lot. I think that um, the harvest that we can do from this uh, production is not only what we get in our plate, but also the transformation of uh, our way of living, our behavior, our local economy, uh, our food transition of the necessary food transition of our territories. So, uh, part one, it's, it's not, I'm not a very much a, a football freak, but I know that uh, Europe is, a, there is a wind of football who is blowing, so um, it's happened that the battle is organized like a football match in two parts. We will have a, a, a break uh, between these two parts and, and some, uh, some advertisement, I, 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 I must say, on, on one uh, product capitalization uh, uh, process. But um, um, now just a, an introduction. We have three teams, three teams from three different networks. Um, Katarzyna from Krakow and uh, Sylvia uh, from Rome and ad hoc expert. Ciao a tutti. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, another network, BPAFnet team, uh, Thiago from uh, Amarante and Marushka from Ljubljana. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it, 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 it seems uh, that we, we, we have um, a sort of warming up of a team now. And, uh, and we have a, a team which is not a team anymore because we have some colleagues uh, from these uh, networks which are um, in suffering from, from COVID at the moment, um, not uh, in danger, but still not able to take part. Uh, Teresa is not there. So, Thibaut, you are uh, from Mansart too. You are uh, a, tome, a team at yourself? I lost the connection. He's trying to log in again. Okay, 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 okay. So, uh, these are all the... The, the difficult issue uh, of a direct. So, um, to present a little bit about uh, how we organize that, it's, uh, we would like uh, to, uh, to go uh, um, a series of stories, stories, stories coming from the different participating city, um, from their own networks, and we want that to be a battle. A battle means a competition, but also that we don't have one network after the others, but all um, mixing, uh, sharing their, their respective experience and sharing their point of view on the different topics that could uh, be uh, uh, developed around this uh, uh, food and urban topic. Um, um, I forgot uh, to, to present uh, Marceline, who is helping Thibaut to... to... Marceline uh, is a thematic program expert, and uh, uh, she uh, will be in charge of uh, the break and the presentation of the Urbac Food Knowledge Hub uh, in the middle of the session. Uh, the idea is to have uh, four minutes each, uh, for each time for the, the stories. Um, me making a very short, short introduction. Uh, the two first stories um, uh, are around eating habits and behavior change. You know that, um, unfortunately, uh, the recent decades of our uh, uh, our consumption, consumption society oriented towards uh, 
uh, always uh, cooking less and spending less time under food and less money under food issues, which sometimes is good because it uh, leaves you other opportunity, but uh, reduce um, the or change or, or made very, very bad food habit. Uh, cities have to cope with behaviors uh, of people who um, don't anymore um, sometimes uh, how to cook from a situation where uh, you don't have uh, uh, food or vegetable available in your neighborhood and you have to, to take uh, transport uh, uh, means uh, or car to, to get this food. So um, one of the interests of uh, our networks is changing these habits, reconnecting people with food. Uh, Bipafnet, uh, Marushka, um, you, you tell us a story about how bees are, are, are important in this changing of habits? Yes, of course. I would be delighted to. Thank you for, for the word. Uh, actually, we always forgot that uh, the food does not grow in the supermarkets. It needs something else. It needs everything in the nature, especially bees. Uh, Ljubljana is, I will just try to say a few words about Ljubljana and then how we actually put the, the bee on the, on the map of the food production in Ljubljana in, and in our partnership. Um, as a capital of Slovenia, it was really always connected to its rural hinterland. We now have approximately 856 farms and uh, in the direct vicinity, which is really, really important for the city center. And now in the past, they actually supply citizens with fresh food, what is really important. Uh, that showed during the COVID-19 um, because uh, that uh, nearby production actually made it possible for the city to, to survive in some moments because we didn't have the possibility to bring in the foreign food. Uh, it is created actually, the Ljubljana really developed a holistic approach to food production in the city and it is created and executed in a way that enables local food production uh, teaches people how to use locally and seasonally produced food and create responsible citizens, which is the most important part. The city of Ljubljana addressed the topic of food supply from uh, many, many different angles, angles, not only just the production of the food, but also from the preservation of agricultural land. This is very important for us. And distribution of food and food should uh, uh, short supply chains. Francois, you are really loud. Could you sorry, mute sorry. yourself? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, it is the most important thing that Ljubljana did was actually to put the bees and other pollinators on the beginning of uh, the food chain and created the whole system of preservation and education and awareness raising. Uh, we introduced also the late mowing to the public green areas in order to upgrade biodiversity in living spaces for pollinators. And we encourage people to plant mellifluous plants and we also create green roofs all over the city. So these are the topics that we started with. And then we started to talk about the bees, how they are important for our survival, for our food production. Because of, of the importance of pollinators in terms of food production and their link to maintaining biodiversity in both rural and urban areas, Ljubljana put special focus on programs for children in order to develop actually the citizens that are the caretakers of the environment in the city. So we are, uh, as you can see, the long distance runners we see that the results of our work that is now going on are going to be seen in 15 years because we will have the responsible citizens. With the BPET in Ljubljana and then, of course, through the BPET net uh, product, um, transfer network, we developed also the API kindergarten, which is really important for us. Uh, and it is uh, a program dedicated to the youngest uh, in, in our society. And first uh, was important not to educate children, but, but educate mentors. So this was our first step. And then together we focused on children. 
Uh, they learn how to be caring and attentive citizens and how to understand nat nature and respect pollinators and are aware that food is actually starts with those little creatures that are all around us. Through the um, program, they learn about the bees. This is really important. They learn, uh, learn about the bee products, which is really also important. They learn how to protect themselves and how to behave around them, how important they are for our survival, and how food is produced and how to create a bee and other pollinators friendly environment. So we are actually really are teaching them a lot of things. And um, Ljubljana, with all activities regarding the food production uh, that begins in kindergarten with learning about bees and then final output, we can say that we are aiming to go towards the short food supply chains and to actually have the society where everybody knows where the food is coming from, who is important for that one, uh, and that we all take good care of the environment. So this is the story of holistic approach of uh, food in Ljubljana on emphasis with bees. So thank you. Thank you, Maroshka. Thank you, fascinating. Bees have always been a fascinating uh, words for kids, and, and it's very interesting to see how um, they are here uh, a carrier, if I may say, or a, a means to, um, to re, um, reconnect the, the children with food. Katarzyna, um, we have also here uh, uh, another typical example of how reconnecting and educating children around food. You explain us a little bit what happened here? Yes, sure. Uh, however, I would rather say that we not only reconnect children with food, but we, we reconnect children with nature. And that's what I would like to to talk about. Um, the future of the earth is in our children's hands. I guess nowadays no one doubts the truth of that statement. But how can we do that since children are becoming more and more distant from nature? One of the steps that can be taken is implementing school gardens in each school. Having that kind of green classroom, we can enable them to observe nature every day and moreover, take part in it. This personal commitment will pay off in a real, intense connection with nature. As Richard Luff says in his book, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, Passion is lifted from the earth itself by the muddy hands of the young. It travels along grass stained leaves to, to the heart. If we are going to save environmentalism and the environment, we must also save an endangered indicator species, the child in nature. Following that recipe, we started the project Garden with Class. Together with teachers, parents, kids and the local community, we created 18 school gardens in Krakow schools. And the idea was to organize them in a communitarian way that will enable schools to have easier maintenance of the garden during the summertime. The community will gain beautiful green space and the school will get assistance in the maintenance. But most importantly, the kids can be brought to nature by digging in the soil, planting vegetables and observing natural processes. Gardening can also teach patience, perseverance and teamwork. Children can discover their strengths and new competences, unknown and undiscovered while learning in typical classroom. By all that, they start to understand nature better than they would ever do learning from books. And the more they understand it, the more they become connected with it. That will also succeed in their later choices regarding the way of living, food consuming and many key issues that influence the future of our planet. By engaging parents in that project, we get extra educational and integrational value. It's confirmed by many examples that nowadays in many areas, those are kids who teach their parents, not vice versa. And it's not on it, and and it not only regards the matter of new technologies, or um, but also climate change or other ecological issues like garbage segregation or water saving. 
New generation of leaders closely connected to nature can support this planet's bright future. Kids from Gardens with Class project will be for sure closer to that aim than those who won't have the chance to see how the tom tomato grows from seed to fruit to taste. Thank you. Thank you, Katarzyna. Uh, I, I, I fully agree with you. It's not only about food, uh, although our topic is to explore uh, today uh, words that are that food is touching and to what food is opening. So I, I get from your point that probably it's, it's also um, a, a way to to start from the kids. Uh, from the from the food that they can grow, from the food that they can experience, uh, to to change their mind, and as you said, to teach their family or or to raise awareness or to start uh, the change uh, of a family in 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 their food habits in in particular. Um, another topic now, uh, which is uh, very much connected with with the first, is. Uh, how do we get uh, the food uh, transition uh, in, in the different territories? Um, which is not only in the plate, but which touch, touches all the system, uh, the, the food system, the local food system and the international food system. Um, <clears throat> um, one of the uh, touch points, if I may say, uh, um, talking about uh, design of services, uh, in this vocabulary, you have this touch point. So how do we touch uh, concretely as a user such a big question? I mean, sending your, your children in, in the canteen at school is one of a very important touch point. Uh, Thibault, do you explain us a little bit about um, uh, how uh, these uh, uh, canteens schemes are touching and maybe changing all the agricultural uh, uh, systems around in the city. Where are we here? So, hi, everyone. So here we are in the municipal farm of Montsartou, and you can see the three farmers of Montsartou cultivating uh, uh, a land which is owned by the municipality and it, which actually uh, produces over six hectares, around 25 tons of vegetables every year that are consumed in school canteens um, and which represents around 85% of all the vegetables consumed in, uh, in school canteens. Um, so it's, um, it's actually was developed. The, the question is how it was developed by, uh, by the city of Montsartou and when. Um, in 2008, when the elected representative of Montsartou decided to switch to the 100% of organic local school canteens, um, they faced a major issue actually. No local organic producers uh, were able to apply to the public procurement of the city because we had a lack of production in our province. There are, no enough, there are not enough local organic food producers. So, afterwards, the elected representative of the city in 2000, 2010 almost as a joke said, well, if no one applies, well, actually we will produce food by ourselves. And which led to the creation of this municipal farm. And this is how the, the whole story begins. And actually we celebrated uh, this year, the 10th year of this uh, municipal farm. Um, and um, this model is actually, it's not only happening in Montsartou, it's uh, in Bicantines, it's also inspired the other partners and notably the city of Troyan in Bulgaria, located in the, the center of Bulgaria, uh, which uh, has different settings than Montsartou. We are in a very densely urbanized area uh, with a pressure on, uh, on agricultural lands. In Troyan, it's much more rural and mountainous, but they decided to do the same because they were also facing a lack of organic producers to supply their, their school canteens. And, and uh, I remember at the beginning of the project, Elena visiting uh, Montsartou and the municipal farm saying, uh, well, we, we won't be able to do all this in, in two years. Uh, we won't be able to achieve this in, in only uh, two years. And actually, uh, if you would uh, visit Troyan today, it's actually what you would see, a municipal farm, the first of its kind in Bulgaria, uh, realized by Troyan, with uh, several greenhouses, the first vegetables harvested in uh, this year, actually, in March and April, distributed to school canteens. And this, 
to, to, to conclude, actually, it's, um, it's a tool to supply canteens. It's a tool to create jobs. As you can see, those people in, on the picture in Montsartre and in Troyan are civil servants. Uh, so working for the municipality, it's a tool also to educate kids who can visit the municipal farm, but it's also a tool for, I would say, education of elected representatives because they, they can realize uh, what they can do, what a, a city can do to feed its own population. And then even think in wider terms, beyond canteens, as an elected representative, what can I do to feed and ensure my, that my population access uh, healthy and sustainable food? Thank you, Thibault. Um, um, it's also, I guess, a demonstrator in a certain way. This is, this is not only creating the jobs of a, this free, by the way, civil servant, but are farmers, which is pretty unusual um, and not certainly very easy to achieve uh, administratively, I mean. Um, but it's also an inspiration, an inspiration for creating new jobs and um, we are back to the BPAF net networks and uh, Thiago in Amarante. Um, how do you create job starting from bees? Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be on the Urbac City Festival. Uh, my name is Thiago Ferreira from Amarante, Portugal. I am the project manager of the Urbac Network I place that focuses on local economy development. But I also participated on BPADnet as a member of the partner city Amarant. And in this pitch, I would like to share some learnings that are from the enrollment on these two amazing Urbac projects. So first question, why should cities look for beekeeping at uh, their local economy development plans? I collect seven reasons. First one is that promoting beekeeping, it's at the same time promoting the economy, but also promoting sustainability. And as we all know, we are the generation that needs to solve the climate changes challenge. And for example, in some cities, in order to protect bees, cities are eliminating pesticides, for example. Second reason, beekeeping activity is moved by passion. Beekeepers are very passionate people. And in city level, we need to promote more economic activities where workers, they feel fulfilled and in order to have happier cities. Third reason, good beekeepers could be people with or without uh, remarkable uh, academic backgrounds. So when you promote beekeeping, you are also promoting opportunities to all the people from the city on a very inclusive way. Number four, beekeeping could be the main job for a beekeeper, having his salary from the activity, but it could also be an extra earning source for people that have other jobs. So beekeeping allows different people to have different value propositions, different value propositions that fit that fits their individual needs. Number five, beekeeping could be an economic opportunity through selling honey and other beehive products, but there is an also an opportunity to, trans to transform them into added value products like meat, cakes or cosmetics. In the beekeeping economy, you will have opportunities producing beehives, producing queens, producing software for producers, between others. So it's a big cluster. Number six, Tourists, they have great curiosity about bees and the honey life cycle. When you can promote touristic routes and experience that can attract new customers to the city and using their visit, you can promote your brands and local products, including the ones that are not related to beekeeping, but beekeep beekeeping products could be uh, the attraction. Number seven, having a friendly territory for bees you will gain benefits on some, some agricultural productions. Some will increase more than 20% of production having bees around. Uh, and it is amazing, I think, this synergy. So these are the seven reasons why I think cities should consider beekeeping activity on the local economy development. And I collect here five insights, five tips to allow cities to think about it. First trip, 
I suggest you to create a B product market on the city center in order to promote beekeeping and the relationship between beekeepers. It is very important that beekeepers know each other and they can share the enthusiasm, the passion, the knowledge and, uh, and provo provide them the opportunity to meet customers in the city center and uh, to allow people to know their products. Second tip, use beekeeping for city center placemaking creating funny experience that children will love, information to nurture the adults, and uh, planting, for example, mellifluous in order to feed the bees and other pollinators, and very important, celebrating the World Bee Day by United Nations. Third tip, promote synergies between beekeeping and business like restaurants, pastries, tourism agencies, and also the city's events and the main media companies. The keeping center of your city will get stronger with these links. Number four, promote the creation of new beekeeping products and startups through innovation competitions, uh, where you will give advertisement for the winners and some prizes that uh, allows them to grow their business. Young people will get very interested in this participation. Number five, use beekeeping products on your city institutional offers. The municipality could be an co important customer uh, that seeds these activities. Use that in gift shops, in touristic shops, with your local identity design and promote them through e-commerce to the city's diaspora. Well, I hope these learnings and tips will be useful for you. Let's drive change to better cities. Thanks. Thank you, Diego. Um, I will uh, chase you if you go on eating the time of the other speakers. Eh? Don't, uh, we should keep to this uh, very strict four minutes. If not, we will not see all the, the, the battles. What I retain from, from the two last uh, stories is that they, they are systemic topic, whether canteens or, or beekeeping are touching a lot and for that they have a strong potential of, of change. Um, these stories are, uh, first stories are a good introduction to our break here uh, in a, a product uh, from Urbact that is collecting stories. So we have developed a thematic approach. You can access all the information about the in very interesting about cases and inspirations from seven entry points. So policy making, as well as uh, supply chain. So from the production to the transformation and distribution, we have uh, lots of interesting information about jobs and skills, community engagement, as well as food solidarity. So on each of these pages, you can find uh, a short extract that is exemplified in the next slide. So a short summary of uh, the topic at stake and then links to all these cases. All the links are analytical, which means um, you get really an overview of uh, what's been implemented in uh, all the cities and you get contact details to reach out to the people. You also have lots of articles and uh, other interesting reports available uh, on this uh, issue. I'm very sorry about the technical issue. Back to you. Thank you, Marceline. Thank you. We are, we are happy to have you back, at least at the beginning, and especially me, because I was embarrassed not knowing exactly the food knowledge of, as, as I should do. Um, we are going in the part two, so I will ask everybody to, to stick to their very four minutes because we have run, uh, we are running a little bit late. So um, uh, we have touched upon economical issues. Um, I think that um, Thibault, uh, you will explain about um, um, how in fact you, you deal with uh, economical aspect of organic. Organic um, is generally meant to be more expensive and uh, in uh, Monsanto, you are producing uh, organic meal at the same price that catering company are producing non-organic meal. Yes, that's exactly exactly right, Francois. Uh, thank you very much. So, just to, to be brief, uh, since 2012, Monsanto's three school canteens 
They deliver around uh, 1,300 meals per day that are 100% organic, mostly local, seasonal, that respect children's nutri nutritional needs. And all of these with no cost increase, as Francois mentioned. And we did, did, did this, sorry, only in around four or five years. So the question is, uh, as we usually think that organic is much more expensive and it's too ambitious to, uh, to achieve that, how is this possible? Uh, how is this feasible to reach such an ambitious objective? And, and it's just uh, that Monsartu is an exception. And actually in Biocantines, no, we believe that it's not. Um, it is actually just about small, tiny actions that you implement that can bring big results. It is about also work and communication within canteens and um, and also a change in the way you understand school canteens and you, you make them function. The, the, um, the most important thing for us in our good practice, I would say, is that the, the key enabler to achieve this um, was to tackle food waste. In five years, in Montsartou, the, the city decreased food waste by 80%, passing by 150 grams per plate to 30 grams only, which actually provided savings, economical savings of around 20 cents per meal, uh, which were reinvesting, reinvested sorry, in organic food, meaning less uh, food waste, savings reinvested in organic food. So that's the key question. And then the, the question is how to implement that actually in your canteens, because it's not only about making savings. It is about small actions, as I was saying. So for instance, how can I tackle food waste? By engaging children in, for instance, sorting out and weighting food waste at the end of their meals. So you create a range, a lines of buckets, and then they just have to sort out the leftovers at the end of the meal. It's a great pedagogical value. And then you can monitor food waste uh, throughout the year. Uh, just enable the kitchen staff to understand whether the recipe was uh, good or not, whether they need to adapt some uh, ingredients, etc. You have all the tools which are very uh, easy to implement, such as, for instance, uh, adapting portions served to children's appetites. Uh, why the heck serving big apples to small children while, when they will only eat a small portion of it? Just cut the apples in quarters and serve quarter, one quarter to a children and then you will see whether he's still hungry or not afterwards. So you see very, very small and, and easy actions to implement. And then you can resort to um, plant proteins also, instead introducing plant proteins instead of uh, meat, for instance. It's uh, great when you combine plant proteins and cereals because they provide the, the amino acids that we need and the same quality of uh, animal proteins. And they are better for the environment and they are better Actually, they make you uh, save some money. And thanks to these savings, you can buy meat of better quality. Of course, all of these changes uh, shouldn't be imposed to kitchen staff, but accompanied through trainings on how to cook raw products, etc. But enabling them to re-becoming cook and to relearning to cook raw produce. And the key conclusion, I would say, is that it is to the canteens to adapt to food production and to what is coming from the field and not the, the, the other way around. Thank, thank you, Thibault. Um, one of the uh, uh, good examples on the economy of organic food, which is always a big question, but also, uh, Thiago, it's, it's uh, an opportunity to, uh, to, to create more jobs. You already say some things about that. Can you develop, but not more than four minutes? Yeah. I will uh, ask Maruska to join and uh, we will start for, for the, the experience in Ljubljana. And uh, Maruska, I would like to make you a question. You share uh, different stories about the beekeeping activity at Ljubljana level for inhabitants, but what about for visitors and tourists? Yeah, thank you, Tiago. It was really a great challenge how to present everything to people that are coming from different parts of the world. We packed everything together with the, uh, within the guided tours around the bee pet. Of course, honey was one of the main topics of this. And uh, it was interesting how uh, the visitors actually get uh, to know the different tastes of honey. This was the first thing. And another thing was actually to um, 
put uh, also on the on the map of BPET, which is quite strange, but uh, to put on the map also the restaurants and the bars. So we managed to create some food uh, connected to the uh, to the honey. And uh, what is the most important is as well that uh, these things actually became some sort of the honey breakfast. So people. Um, embraced it, they embraced the, the idea of uh, having honey for the breakfast and they uh, introduced it, we introduced it uh, on the national level also to the uh, to the schools and, uh, and, and, and other actually public uh, public um, spaces and um, which I'm, 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 this is not so connected to the tourists but it is actually connected to the companies that embrace the idea of honey breakfast and they they also have this through the bees and everything they express their co co cooperative uh, responsibility and, um, and this gives the opportunity also for some beekeepers to develop the idea of the new uh, entrepreneurship idea and uh, we have a special beekeeper that keeps uh, your bees for you and uh, it gives it, it uh, just give you uh, they give you the honey so you can rent a hive you can be responsible and at the end of course you have a honey for honey breakfast so this is something that happened for for us but i'm sure uh, especially if you look at this picture i think that we also have the same story with you so how you managed to put the honey on the plate of your tourists <laughs> yeah. yeah i think for uh, tourism destination food is very important because it's, uh, it allows experiences and um, and uh, in our case and you can you are seeing the picture of the dolman shop is a shop of local produ production local products it's very interesting because a, a shop uh, beca become a, a tourist attraction. This this shop is not uh, for profit; is a promotional one, but people can buy the products. But it is uh, is designed in a way that it is the shop place where small producers can sell their products, and they are present, presented in, a, and people can try in this shop. And uh, actually, uh, the visitors, the tourists, they get impressed with the products and the opportunities for uh, product consumption and uh, for new customers uh, they they happen on this place uh, not only for be beehive products but also for one sector and other sectors so it's very interesting this, uh, this a place where local produce, producers they uh, promote their products become a touristic attraction and an opportunity for for some, for some beekeepers to start to even export their honey and other products. Thank you. Thank you both for this dialogue. Um, one place, one topic uh, which was triggering discussion in the preparation of this session is the very fact that uh, cities getting concerns with some things which is not an, generally in Europe an official competence of the city level, the city governance level, um, but that has an impact, in fact, on, on the governance, on, on, on what the city should change in his way of governing in order to make space for, for food. Katarzyna, you provide us a very strange pictures. There is a hole in your bread. Can you tell us a little who was, bit what the symbolic who was in Krakow? meaning of these pictures? <laughs> who was in Krakow uh, then knows uh, that uh, this is a very typical Krakow Spressel, very char characteristic one. Uh, but I would like uh, not to talk about this uh, pressel, but uh, I would like to add some bitter taste to this honey atmosphere we have, unfortunately, because um, when you sometimes when you start your first steps of a transfer process, you never know uh, where they will lead you. And sometimes you discover an inconvenient truth as I did. During the last two and a half years of urban project, Krakow's inhabitants not only have gained new community gardens, but also learned, uh, but also learned what they are, how to organize them and what profits they get from gardening as such. But those years have showed that what the inhabitants mainly look for in community gardens 
is social integration and friendly green space, not food. And it's not because we are such a wealthy and independent society, not at all. A few weeks ago, when the second wave for uh, the Urbact project was open, I decided to submit the application for the BioCantines project. I started to search for some data necessary to prepare the application form, and I discovered with great amazement how little knowledge about feeding our kids in school canteens we have. Moreover, how the topic of food as such is completely abandoned. Analyzing the topic of school canteens, it appeared that there are, of course, a lot of regulations, programs, or even contests regarding the topic of healthy food. But there are no controlling processes or global programs that would enable structural changes regarding supplies or food waste. Digging deeper, another problem appeared. It looks like in the whole of the city administration, there is no department to which this topic is known or lies in their competences. That means that until now, no one is responsible for future food sovereignty at all. For sure, there are in the city more urgent issues like transportation or green energy, but not having at least a single person who has a knowledge and interest in the topic of food is really a bothering issue. Krakow has a population of almost 1 million inhabitants. As the forecasts show, in 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. So inevitably, Krakow's population will grow too. How will the city support food for the growing population? And how long, the topic, uh, how, how long the, will this topic be on the margin of the city policies? Maybe the spectacular growth of community gardens that I hope will continue in the next few years will be a cue for that problem, at least for those who like digging in the soil. But maybe the problem does not concern only my city. Who knows what you will discover in your cities? Hopefully, as one of my friends who is a farmer said, the city has everything that's needed to support healthy food for, uh, to their inhabitants. Land, water, sun, and most of that is for free. However, the key to success is a long-term strategy re regarding food sovereignty. Without that, we may become another Detroit based on the determination of their inhabitants. Thank you, Katarzyna. Thank you also. Uh, special thanks because generally when, when we try to say we are going to tell stories, they are generally successful stories. And, and we learn very much from not unsuccessful, but, but from challenges, from holes in the bread that should be, uh, uh, <coughs> should be <coughs> uh, tapped. In a, Last uh, aspect, you already introduced it in your speech, is the question of resilience of food sovereignty. So um, uh, we experience uh, and still are experiencing in all parts of the world a very hard situation at the moment with the pandemic. And um, it, it teaches us that uh, in places where there was resilience, where there was a certain sovereignty. Um, Sylvia, you will explain a little bit uh, about the phenomenon uh, of reinvesting community gardens uh, to feed your family. Yes, um, I will be happy to tell you something more about urban gardens, mostly because urban gardens are much more than growing food. As a matter of fact, uh, I have the, I'm fortunate to be part of the great Rurban team and uh, to live in the city of Rome that is one of the largest cities that has rural areas within its boundaries, largest quantity of rural areas. And um, so what I want to say is that many kinds of things can happen in urban gardens. And this story I want to tell you is something uh, tied very much with this last period during the pandemic. Uh, so this is the story of Andrea, a photographer, a sports reporter in Rome. 
and uh, of course as being a sports reporter uh, of all kinds of sports events from championships to olympic games um, of course during the pandemic everything had stopped and um, his attention uh, to be precise, has always been focused on the protagonists, on the athletes, more than the events itself. So, uh, during the pandemic, since all the sports events uh, were uh, called out uh, and future was very uncertain, uh, his question became, whose story can I tell? And since he lived near an urban garden, a very big urban garden in Rome called Ortonove, um, he, he came up with two possibilities. Looking at that garden, he thought maybe um, since there is this urban garden near my house, I can understand better um, how the pandemic is leading people towards nature. The other idea he had was maybe I can also speak about what are the athletes doing, how are they coping with the pandemic uh, stop in this period. But he started and was so curious about the urban garden that he decided to investigate and learn more about the, the people that were, were going there. Um, actually, um, his method is to approach people first without his camera. So he meets them, he understands their habits, their style of life, and observes. And once his recurrent presence makes him invisible, somehow invisible to the others that get, get used to his presence, then he starts taking pictures and bringing his camera. So he, in the end, he was impressed by the community in the urban garden on how differences disappeared among all the people that were going there. Um, social, gender, uh, generation, uh, and also the, the strong sense of belonging each gardener had and the strong sense of community in times characterized by isolation as the pandemic has brought to everyone. So, he uh, touched with hand how here the desire of sociality was spontaneous and most of all it was possible um, to be true this project is not finished andrea wishes to continue continue his acquaintance with more urban gardens and most of all with all the gardeners and the people that cultivate the city uh, so this is a story that tells us about urban gardens as not only a place where people grow food, but where a photographer with no job could actually find something new, interesting, uh, a new discovery that actually led him to, towards a new style of life. He has a, a truffle a dog, a dog that smells truffle, and he wanted to plant with his wife uh, in a land they have, uh, they planted like 200 and trees and they, and they want to start this new enterprise. And so this is really bringing people back to nature and reconnecting uh, through food to nature. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. That's very important for behavior change and we are back to our first topic. Um, Still about resilience uh, and uh, what we learn from the capability of cities to react to pandemic and to face uh, food problems. Thibaut, you were touching upon uh, this uh, uh, surprising and quick development of uh, the, uh, the, the municipal farm in Trojan in Bulgaria, where we see here uh, the progress uh, of food growing. You tell us more about the impact on, on resilience or what you experience in Monsanto? Yes, th thank you very much. Indeed, I, I already tackled this, uh, this issue, the creation of municipal farms. And, and they are very much uh, symbolic of what uh, actually Sylvia talked about, huh? the, this importance of food sovereignty, food resilience. Um, in, in very concrete terms, I just wanted to start with examples with the pandemics, as, as Sylvia said. 
um, we could see in Monsartou and actually in Troyan, just with the municipal farm just created two years ago, that the first harvests were normally provided supply to school canteens. But because school canteens were closed, those uh, harvests went directly to special groceries or to households' needs. And this is very much symbolic of what uh, a city's uh, objective in terms of resilience can be. Um, when we think about in Montsartou and in Bay Cantines in general about food resilience and food sovereignty, it doesn't mean that uh, we will be sovereign on our own. It's not the idea of being completely autonomous. Uh, it's much more than that. It's just how a city can take back control of uh, private actors. How can a city with its inhabitants decide over which type of food the inhabitants want to eat? Uh, where does it come from, etc. And and just a question for everyone, actually. Do you know what you will eat in 2045? Do you know what you will eat in two decades? That's exactly the question that we, we actually asked ourselves during Biocantines, because that's the big questions, actually. In front of all the challenges that we are going to face, all the challenges that we have already faced, the pandemic was just a, a tiny example somehow. But taking into account the climate change, for instance, or uh, sources of insecurity, uh, some market issues at global level, etc. We have to think about that. And um, thinking in terms of perspective is extremely important. So that's why the municipal farm as such is um, might not be a solution for all cities. Uh, it's not adapted to our context, but for Montsartou and Troyan, it's an extremely useful tool to educate supply canteens, of course, but educate the population, raise awareness also towards the, the wider public. And also it's no coincidence that in Montsartou, for instance, the municipality was created in 2010, and uh, in 2012, the elected representative decided to triple agricultural lands on the territory. It's no coincidence, actually. It's a way of realizing that the city has the power to change things on the ground and to improve uh, food to, uh, to the inhabitants. And that's, that's all for me. <laughs> Thank you, Thibault. Thank you all for playing this game. Uh, we are now, the time is over. Uh, I think we, we get a very good panorama from behavior change to uh, food sovereignty from a local uh, economy and the creation of jobs from even the change of the very governance of a city towards uh, a, a form of, of transition. Food is really a systemic topic to exploit. Um, before leading us, uh, for people who are listening, there will be a, a pool to assess this session. Thank you to all. This was a great pleasure to host you in this gentle battle.